is the InnovaBuzz podcast, helping smart businesses be even more innovative. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Welcome to episode number 95 of the InnovaBuzz podcast, designed to help smart businesses with an interest in innovation become even more innovative. In this episode, my guest is Nina Radetich of Radetich Marketing and Media. Nina talked to us about marketing as a system and framework and about using storytelling and video to draw people in and connect. We also talk about ways to appear natural on video, the importance of practice and self-assessment to improve, and how Nina uses her journalism background to write quality content that tells a story and engages with the audience. As a former news anchor on network television, Nina is uniquely qualified to talk to us about video, storytelling and engaging the audience through the camera. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Nina Radetich. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to have with me today on this episode of the InnovaBuzz podcast, all the way from Las Vegas in the USA, Nina Radetich from Radetich Marketing and Media. Now, Nina has a background in journalism and uses that experience to create quality content for her clients, content that tells a story and engages the audience. She also is a duct tape marketing certified consultant, so she's a specialist in marketing and marketing systems. And I know on her website she talks about um, unlocking the mysteries of marketing and harnessing the power of a true marketing system, which is language that really speaks to me and resonates with me. She's also a host of the Small Biz Power Show, which I think you stream on Facebook Live, but also is a podcast. So welcome to the in Overbuzz podcast, Nina. Oh, Jürgen, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you all the way from the US of A. <laughs> yeah, it's a great privilege to have you as our guest today. And Phil Singleton was the one who suggested we get you on the podcast. So a big hello to Phil. Oh, thanks to Phil for thinking of me. I appreciate that. Yeah. Now, you were for many years a news anchor on um, television in Las Vegas. So, but Let's go back even before that. When when you were a young child, what did you actually want to be when you grew up? Did you have a clear idea? Oh, very clear. I pursued the dream. Um, ever since I was a probably at the age of five, um, I wanted to be a, a news anchor. There was a oh. in northern. I grew up in Northern California, and there was a show there called Evening Magazine in the San Francisco Bay Area. And the two hosts of Evening Evening Magazine were so well-versed on the culture of the Bay Area, just everything that was going on. They just were in the know. And I wanted so badly to be them. I just, I wanted to, I wanted to have my finger on the pulse of a community. I, I found that fascinating. I loved that they were able to, to share the stories of a community. And so that, I, I locked in on that when I was really young and I pursued that. Now, when I got to college, I went to UCLA and when I, I when I got to college, there was a, a minor crisis of what is it that I really want to do? But I came back to that pretty quickly and, um, and right out of college, I pursued that and, um, I started at, at uh, KABC in LA as, as ripping scripts when there were scripts that were handed out long before the iPad age mm-hmm. um, on, on a 4 a.m. to noon shift. <laughs> it was brutal. And, uh, and then I made a tape and I, I landed a job in Bakersfield, California, um, which for, for people down under is, is um, about in central California area, a real small town. And I was there for a year and a half and came to Las Vegas and uh, the rest is history. Mm. And so you had a career that spanned quite a few years as a TV news anchor. And what what made you then decide to move out of that and get into your own small business? So also when I was a child, I had several of my own entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, I had something called the snail company. <laughs> where mm. <laughs> there was a snail. There was a snail problem in um, Northern California, and I would go right. for for a penny a snail. I would go to my you know uh, mom's friends' yards and pick up snails and 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 rid them of the pests. Um, I, I had a uh, um, you know again this was all pretend, but I was always pretending to sort of own my own thing and do my own thing. So I don't know that I, I always had that entrepreneurial bug in me 
Um, and, you know, I, I had a career in, in television news that spanned close to 20 years. I think it was 18 years total. And the business just started to change. And right about the same time, I had some personal things go on, great personal things. I got married. Nine months later, we had, our, we had a child. And I just felt a shift. And I was, um, I had ceased being challenged. And I knew that it was time to make a change. I also knew that as a mom, and this is really the driving factor, as a mom, um, having flexibility in, in owning my own business was paramount in order to, to, to be a good mom. Now, I, you know, some days, some days I wonder what I was thinking because sometimes I think it would be much easier to have a job. Um, however, I, I just, I, knowing that I can go to my child's school if I want to, accompany him on a field trip, you know, he's six now. And and that has been invaluable to me. So it was really just a, a combination of factors, you know, things in my personal life, the business was changing, um, I was unchallenged, and it was just time for a change. Hmm. It's great, isn't it, when you've got that freedom and you can make time for the personal things in your life, particularly as a young mother. Yeah. Hmm. Young, young, is a, young is probably not the right word for me. <laughs> started late we started late with kids but but no I mean as a, as a new mom for sure it was it was really important and um, and I have not looked back hmm. yeah I, I remember when my kids were young and I was in the corporate world and I had one of these jobs where I spent 30 odd percent of my time traveling um, I was a little bit I was watching a George Clooney movie on Saturday about and his objective in life was to get to the million mile frequent flyer club and I think I achieved that about five times over and I thought you know it's it's actually not quite as glamorous as it makes out to be and certainly I think the um the time with the kids suffered a little bit as a result although I did take a lot of care to make up for that so Mm -hmm. and and, you know we have a good relationship but Mm -hmm. I really see now being in my own business how that you know, having that freedom is just brilliant. It's priceless, isn't mm. it? I mean, just just knowing that you're in control. The the type A personality in me, though, has a very tough time. You're going leaving it, um, and because I am virtual and I work out of a home <laughs> office, I, I'm you know trying to set boundaries. You know, when when you're driven and you want to make something successful, it's it's really hard to. Um, compartmentalize these pieces of your life. So I, I still, I mean, every day that's a, that's a real struggle for me still. Hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure that's common to all businesses. I mean, I still struggle with it, even though even during my corporate career I had a home office and I was working a lot out of home, um, mm-hmm. you know, when I wasn't traveling. So it is a big challenge, yeah. Now, how did you choose then to go into marketing from uh, media? Yeah, some some people say, "How did you make? You know, what what, what is? Where's the connection there?" And it, to me, it's a very simple connection. It made a lot of sense. The, let me go back though. The first iteration of my business was solely social media marketing. So, mm-hmm. um, the Radatich marketing and media side of my business, you know, where I expanded to include all digital marketing, website design, SEO, um, blogging, you know, all all the things that that go along with digital marketing. Um, that's really the second iteration of my business, and that's only about a year and a half in at this point. Um, the first iteration was just social media marketing. Social media at the end of my television career had just sort of uh, gained some really big exposure. I mean, that was around um, 2012 when I left. Um, I, you know, I was sort of a late adopter. I kind of, uh, I, I avoided it. <laughs> I didn't want another way for people to to tell me that my eyebrows looked funny on air or that that pink jacket was not the right choice. So I, I sort of avoided it for a while. And, and then once I finally got into social media, I, I really appreciated the connection that it allowed me. Um, and, a, and it allowed me to, with viewers and, and people who were watching me on a nightly basis, it allowed me to understand more about them. And I I really liked that. Um, I didn't think I would, and and I did. So when I left television news, I started a social media, solely social media marketing business. And what I quickly realized was I wanted to serve small businesses, and small businesses needed more 
than social, just social media. They needed a full marketing system. Hmm. And so I, um, you know, I transitioned that business um, not very well. I didn't do a very good job of that transition, to be honest. Took a, took a job in, in, the, in the interim and then started this second iteration of my business. I wanted to do some research and, and, and figure out exactly how I was going to go into this entrepreneur thing and stick with it and make the commitment and not go back. So I've had some, I mean, this journey has been a one big up and down for the last five years. And I'll tell you what, I have learned more in the last five years than I did in 18 years in TV news. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I reminded, I spoke to Michael E. Gerber a, a little while ago on the podcast, and one of his mantras now is every small business, um, as you say, every life a legacy, every small business a school. So, you know, and I think he talks to <laughs> <Yes>. that education. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Every day. It's nice. Some days I'm like, can I just stop learning? <laughs> hmm. I'm, I need a break from the learning. But I think that's what attracted me to this, and that's what keeps me at it. I was unchallenged uh, towards the end of my television career. I was very fortunate to rise up through the ranks pretty quickly in TV news. So I was on the anchor desk probably, you know, two years into when I came to Las Vegas. And I stayed there for, you know, 16, 14 years. And um, I, I wasn't, I had ceased to, to learn anything. And I think... I was looking for challenges outside of work. I, I started to do triathlons um, because I, I think I, I wanted something different. Um, I, needed, I needed a new challenge. And so, um, boy, did I ever get it in, in starting my business. Mm. Yeah. It's certainly a journey, isn't it? Which, um, uh, yeah. 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 Which is, um, I think, good to go on that journey and then use that as to model for your clients, which is, I think, basically the philosophy you're espousing through the marketing system that you promote. Absolutely. And, and that's, that was what attracted me to the duct tape marketing model was this idea of strategy before tactics. So you build out the play, you determine, and, and you talk a lot about this too, Jurgen. I mean, this is, this is again, speaking your language. I mean, it's, it's determining, you know, who is your ideal client? Who are we talking to? Hmm. Who are we trying to reach? And, you know, and, and what makes us do what we do differently and how do we communicate that? And then putting in place the tactics that, that are going to support that strategy. And I think that's a hard turn for a lot of people to make. And what the duct tape marketing framework does is it ties the two together. It ties strategy with tactics with the focus being on strategy first. And I, I, it resonated so highly with me that when I set up my business, I installed the duct tape marketing system in my business. And, and to this day, that's how I market. So, um, and, and, you know, I focus on, you know, different things, different channels that work for me. You mentioned the Facebook Live show. I mean, that's been been phenomenal for me. So I focus sort of on what I think my strengths are. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with video. I'd love to do more video, but the problem with me and video is I get stuck on, it's got to be perfect, <laughs> I can't, right? So, yeah. so I, I, you know, I need, to, I need to let some of that go. So, um, you know, I'm a work in progress too, and, and that's what I understand about my clients. You know, we're all works in progress. Hmm. And, um, but, but the system has been, you know, has, I, I have seen spectacular results um, for, for some of my clients as a result of installing this system. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and, you know, I highly recommend that people read the book, Duct Tape Marketing, definitely, because I think it, it, the whole principle um, that John Jantz describes in that is is priceless and mm -hmm. the structure and so on. Now, we, you know, I read the book a while ago, as I mentioned to you before we started the interview, but I've kind of built out a system that has some elements of that but has a lot of other stuff built in as well. So it just suits us better because it's the way I do my marketing and so as you say that you know if you do it for yourself and then um then you're genuine about it and you teach other people to do it that way as well but certainly having a strategy in place and understanding who your target market is and understanding what they're really looking for and then making sure that what you've got is actually a match for what they're looking for and what they need mm -hmm. um, they're kind of core to the whole thing yeah, and I, I also think that, you know, to, to your point, I mean, m making sure you're a match is, is really an important piece that sometimes is missed. And, you know, I, I mean, I was on a call uh, just last week with a business that, you know, I work with local businesses. I mean, that's who I work with, local professional service businesses, and that's really my target market. And, you know, this company was 
you know, a, a very large company with several web properties. And, and I knew right away, even just talking to them, you know what, we're not the right fit for you. Mm. And, and it's taken me a while, you're going because you feel like you're saying no to an opportunity and you feel like you're saying, well, maybe I should just, you know, <laughs> fake it till you make it kind of thing. But, but I really knew sort of in my heart, like this, this is not the right fit for me because it's a, it's a, you know, it's too big of a company. It's, it's not congruent with my experience. And so I think when you have the strategy dialed in, you are able to identify the opportunities that are going to be a win-win for, for both, for both the client and for you. And I hmm. think it takes a little bit of time to, I guess, have the guts to, to know who exactly you are serving and, and how you can serve them well. I mean, you've, you've just gone through this, right? Yeah, that's right. We've, we've just niched down even further than what we had before. I, I thought I had a fairly well-defined niche, but in speaking to people, you know, it became clear that I couldn't explain it well enough and people didn't get the niche. So I thought, well, maybe it's not niched down well enough. And then we did a um, planning retreat for a number of businesses. So I've got a joint venture team that we do this with. Did that back in May and actually transformed the businesses that we had come along on that, you know, transformed their business quite amazingly. But the thing that struck me was as one of the people running the event and, and working with other businesses, I also looked at my own business and went through a big transformation there. And part of that was niching down further on my ideal client. And, and it's scary to niche down. And a lot of people, as you say, you feel like, oh, I'm kind of closing off some opportunities. But what happened to me, and I think most people find this if they do it properly, is that all of a sudden a lot of opportunities showed up that were actually a really good match that probably wouldn't have showed up before that. Isn't that amazing? I mean, mm. was, that, was that surprising to you? Uh, yes and no. I mean, it was mm -hmm. not that in principle it wasn't surprising, but the speed at which that happened and, and the number of opportunities that all of a sudden came up, that was a little bit surprising. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other thing that happens, of course, if you've got a really clear picture of your ideal client, um, and I've got examples of this where it's happened, and I, I build out information around my ideal client that really I... I actually have a persona with an image so matching good. that persona and that image is in my mind and that triggers all the information that's associated with that. So I can actually give you a whole story about uh, the ideal client, what stories they actually tell themselves and how they make their buying decisions and what their real needs are and what their personal situations are and so on. And when, when I'm in groups of people and there's discussions happening, I'll straight away go, oh, there's an ideal client, you know, and it might wow. be somebody that they're talking about that just triggers that because I've got that understanding. So that, that's quite amazing. And, I, you know, when I first discovered that, I thought that this is so powerful. Well, and then think about how easy content creation is. I mean, exactly, you, you, yeah. basically, you're in the person's head, right? I mean, yep. you, you know exactly who you want to work with. And, and beyond that, you know exactly how they think and how they make decisions. And hmm. so, so when it comes to creating content, I mean, you, you've created a story. And then the, sto the storytelling around what you do to help them becomes simple. I think that is, that is – uh, it's not easy to do, though. I mean, it's just not. Um... No, it's not. And, you know, I'm, I'm by no means perfect at it. I'm mm -hmm. far from it. But it's just a, something that evolves over time and gets more refined over time. And like you say, you know, everything, everything fits together so that the impact that it has on the business and, and the fact that all of a sudden there's all these new referrals coming up is is – not just the one thing of niching down some more, it's, it's because the messaging is suddenly more aligned to that one specific thing. Mm -hmm. It's because everything has become that much more targeted to that audience. Mm -hmm. And I say to people all the time, because people are afraid to do this, and I was too, um, I say that doesn't mean to say you have to say no if the, a client comes in that is not in that ideal niche and yet right. you believe you can help them and you want to take on that job, that there's no rule that says you have to say no. 
yeah, you're not locked into yeah. it. It just, it, you know, yeah, it has to feel right. It has to feel right. That's right. And I think what you mentioned earlier about turning away business and, you know, I, I like to refer them on to somebody that I think would be yes. a better fit in that situation because then you're still helping them. Of course. But, but to take somebody on board where you have doubts as to your ability to deliver on what they need or if there's other issues around not a good fit is not serving either person or either business well. Not at all. Not at all. And I think sometimes, you know, you know, I think sometimes there's a there's a warring faction in your head where you say, boy, this is a little bit out of my comfort zone or this is really out of my comfort <laughs> yeah. zone. Maybe I should take this on mm. um, just because, you know, all the gurus say that, you know, you should push yourself out of your yeah, comfort right, zone. Yeah. So you're trying to sort of balance the, you know, is it a win win for, for you and the client or, you know, is this, you know, uh, or is this just a challenge that is just too challenging that, that nobody's going to win? So, so what is, you know, balancing sort of that, that risk mitigation almost is, is figuring out, you know, if it's the right decision for you or not. And, you know, usually I, I you know, I, I rely on my gut, which, you know, it may or may not be correct, but I usually can, <laughs> can, I usually get some indication in my gut of, of whether or not it's, it's going to be right. So I, I go with that. And uh, nine times out of 10, I think it's been, I've been a good, a decent decision maker. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> I probably missed out on a lot of opportunities, huh? Yeah. Well, like you say, you've got to trust your own instincts mm -hmm. and where do you, push the boundaries to extend yourself because you definitely want to do that. If you're not um, extending and not learning as, you know, you're driven by learning new things and doing new things, then you're not bringing innovation to your clients. But at the same time, if you're jumping into into a shark-infested pool where you don't have the right tools to survive, <laughs> then it's probably like the not, a, not a good idea. <laughs> right. That's a good visual. I yeah. like it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Spe now, speaking of visual, because you mentioned something before about um, needing to be perfect with video and that, because you know the power of video today is quite amazing, and a lot of people are scared of getting in front of the camera and uh, are afraid of looking bad or are afraid of uh, messing up the lines when they want to present something, and so they don't take action to actually get on camera and I think they're missing a huge opportunity. Now, most people would say, hey, if you've been a news anchor for 18 years, then you're probably quite comfortable in front of the camera and you you do a lot more of that. So I think, you know, from what I've seen, you've, you know, you've done um, quite a bit of video, but I know you mentioned that you want to make everything perfect. Well, I'm not one who is likely to jump on Facebook Live from my webcam. Um, I, I think that's what, what I mean. I mm -hmm. think because I got used to, you know, having a, a, you know, a skilled videographer and a skilled editor who was able to tell a good story, you know, with, with teaming up with, with me, you know, doing interviews, um, I, I think because I, I grew accustomed to that, I'm still having trouble embracing this sort of YouTube-esque format that video has taken nowadays. Not to say that there's anything wrong with it, but I think I, I'm maybe a little stuck in I want it to have a really professional look to it hmm. just because that's I, – I think that's my brand. That's how I relate to people. Now – I think I'm probably missing out on some opportunities because there have been days when I've been like, gosh, I really should share that. And I'll share a post on Facebook <laughs> instead of, you know, hopping on and doing a Facebook Live. I, I would imagine, you know, with Facebook's algorithm now, that's obviously going to reach more people. But it, it's, you know, I've just, I have a style. And so I've sort of just said, okay, well, this is my style. My style is more highly produced. Um, and I'm encouraging my clients to, to not be that way. Um, but some of them are so uncomfortable being on camera that what I've done to solve that is I have told them, let's do an interview. Let's just sit mm -hmm. down and do something interview style where you're not looking straight at the camera because there's something about that camera being pointed straight at you that yeah. is so uncomfortable for people, right? I mean, so I, I, having somebody who is <clears throat> has given them some questions in advance and says these are the topics that we want to cover and then leading them down a path 
to basically what I consider to be good sound bites, and then maybe taking that video and editing it on the back end, giving it a nice intro, giving it a you know a nice close. That's sort of the the type of video that I think that we excel at, and it's my style. Um, so I, I need to figure out a way to bring in sort of the like what I call the YouTube esque sort of grainy. Uh, you know, <laughs> unfinished look into that a little bit more, but it's hard for me with my background. It just is. Yeah. I, I understand what you're saying about the interview, and I think that actually is a great format to get people talking and naturally um, bringing out content online. I mean, I've with this type of podcast and an interview, I find that quite easy to do now. I've been doing it for nearly two years. And really, it's just a conversation with somebody about a topic that I'm interested in and they're interested in and we're both passionate about. So it's pretty easy. I also do um, solo presentations online and I really find those very challenging, even though I've been doing those for quite a lot of time as well. But it's I guess if my background's not on camera or it's not a performance background so I struggle a little bit with that whereas if it's just if somebody else is there and it's a conversation with another person it's suddenly different. And that's the biggest piece with video is it feels unnatural to people mm. and you know over years of, of being in front of a camera every night and delivering news I, I had to learn to communicate as if the camera were a person. person yeah. And it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, you're going to, I should send you some, some of my first anchoring. I mean, it's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> my first, you know, night in Bakersfield is I still have the, the CD of it. It's pretty funny. <laughs> um, but it's nice to kind of look to see where I've come to, you know, I just, the, the confidence growth and, and that kind mm. of thing. So, but I had coaches, I mean, and, and, you know, I practice this every night for mm. tw the better part of 20 years. So I, I am very comfortable in, in front of a camera um, because I see the camera as I see another person on the other side of it. That's just always how I've been. People, you know, when when I would see them in public and if they recognized me, if I had makeup on, <laughs> I didn't have makeup on, they didn't recognize me. But uh, if I had makeup on and they recognized me, they'd say, oh, you know, we invite you into our living room every night. And I mm. was so flattered by that. And, and so as I was, when I was, delivering the news, I, I really felt I tried to be responsible about communicating what I was saying and not just reading what was on the teleprompter. All of the stuff that that I read was was edited by me, was made to be more conversational by me. I mean, it, it was a lesson in storytelling and conversational writing, and it's never left me, and it has served me very well in the marketing realm, very yeah. well. Well, I'd like to come back to storytelling a little bit, but I think there's this a whole bunch of points there that you've just made in that that I think are really valuable lessons. First of all, practice. Um, yeah. You know, okay, it was your job to get on and read the news every day, so you were forced to practice it. But from the beginning, you weren't very good, and yeah. then you developed the skill to a very high level because I'm guessing that you don't last 18 years as a newsreader if you're not really good. So practice and getting out there and don't worry about what the first thing looks like because if you regularly practice and do it on an ongoing basis, then you do get better. So I think that's that's a really important one. Well, you also have to watch yourself. <laughs> that's the other thing. You know, I was I was talking to another friend who um, who was he was being interviewed on a podcast and um, he said, I don't know. I don't know if I'm doing a good job. I'm not you know, I'm not really sure. I go, well, did you listen? He goes, I, I don't, I know. I go, you've got to listen. You know, what, yeah. are you what are you talking? You've got to listen. He's, oh, it's awful to hear my own voice. I, I understand. I heard my own voice for 20 years. It was awful. But mm. but I watched. I mean, up until the, you know, the, the day that I left, I, I watched and, you know, watched for nuanced things that I was doing. I worked with a coach. And, and I'll be darned if every time he didn't come into town, every time he found some little glitch <laughs> or little thing that I'd <laughs> that I didn't know I was doing, you know? So there's always, there's always room to improve. Hmm. And, but the, but you gotta be willing to actually sit down and go and, and reserve judgment and just, and watch yourself and, and, you know, pick out one thing. I mean, because you're not going to fix everything. 
it, you know, I say, you know, a lot and I try to fix that. I probably said, you know, a lot on this podcast, but, but I, you know, I focus on that kind of thing or, or, you know, maybe I've got, I'm lifting my elbow funny or, or maybe I've got sort of a, a tick or something that, that is noticeable when I'm, I'm talking. So and you can't fix everything, but focus on one thing at a time and, you know, rehearse it, tr- practice it. If you're going to do some video, you know, sit down in front of a camera, have a loved one shoot you before you actually record um, so that, you know, when you actually do the final recording, it's, you've rehearsed it several times before you're, you're actually putting it out there. Yeah, that's all great advice. I took a long time before I started listening to my own podcasts. <laughs> listening back <laughs> for, the hard, very, right? for the very same reason. Then I started listening to them and I've been listening regularly recently and I've got that, you know, problem. So that's what <laughs> I need to be working on, the you know and the um. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> I do it. Everybody yeah. does it. So, yeah, that's really great advice. And I really encourage people to go ahead and just try it out because it, the engagement you get from getting on camera and video and, you know, putting your face out in front of people and people see a real person there and they see the emotion, they see the passion that you have for your business or whatever it is that you're presenting, it just is so much better than writing on a page. It is It is no like and trust all in one. Hmm. And That's right. So, yeah, storytelling. I wanted to explore the storytelling a little bit more because one of the things that I think a lot of online content tends to be fairly dry and... I love the ones that actually tell a story in some way. So how do you, how did you take from the newsroom where you're telling stories all the time, even though they're, they're well, some of them would be kind of sad stories, some of them would be happy stories, but how did you translate that into a marketing tool? That is such an interesting question. So, <laughs> you know, I think... Because I, I don't know that I know the answer. I don't know that I can explain it. I feel like it just happens. And so trying to, to, to help explain that, and maybe I'll just, you know, give an example. I think there's a tendency with, you, you write a blog post, for example, and you, you put, you know, hey, check it out. I wrote a blog post on Facebook advertising. Okay, I'm not going to read that. I'm just, I'm not. You know, what's, what's the story behind it? You know, is, is, you know, is the story, I have been working for three months now to figure out this Facebook ad craziness, and I found the solution. Um, I wrote a whole blog post about it. I would love it if you read it. It just, it, it inserts personality. It gives you a reason to, it's a story around something that's really simple, um, and taking the time to infuse stories into everything you do, whether it's social media, um, whether it's a blog post. I know a speaking coach here locally, and her name is Alexia Vernon, and she is the most amazing storyteller. Now, her emails are notoriously really long, but she tells stories about her daughter. Um, you know, her daughter is, I think, three or four, and she'll tell stories about her daughter and, and find a way to weave it into a lesson about speaking, and it's brilliant. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I can't help but like stop and read her emails, <laughs> not only because she's a friend of mine, but, but because she really is masterful about taking a story that's, that's personal to her and weaving it back into business. It's not an easy thing to do, um, but I, you know, I encourage all business owners to start with the why piece. Mm. I, ha- I work with, a, you know, um, <clears throat> the chiropractor who is very big in the wellness space here. You know, he's, he's basically helping people here locally um, put their diabetes into remission. He has had some amazing results with clients. And he has a really fascinating reason why he got into the wellness side of things. And it has to do with his mom. And, and um, she was ill as, you know, when he was a child. And he, she missed a lot of, of things that were important to him as a child. And um, today, in this day and age, she's no longer with us. And, you know, he lost her at a young age. 
and he felt horrible that she was so sick all the time and wanted to find a way to help her. It turns out that he probably could have, you know, had she been living today. And so when he starts, you know, some of his diabetes presentations or he starts any of, of you know, his speaking, he, t he tells that story. It's really, really powerful. Hmm. And I think that that's, you know, that's what connects us. Um, that's how you put a face to a brand. That's how you become more than a logo is really communicating who you are and, and why you're doing what you're doing. I think it's why we're seeing this explosion of, of, you know, coaches online who are able to connect because they are able to, to tell stories of, you know, on Facebook live or, or wherever it is. It's just that the social media gives us that ability to really, really tell stories more than we ever used to. Yeah, that's great advice. I, and I wonder, I was thinking as you were telling that, because I really admire people that can do that and can take, mm -hmm. you know, a personal story like that. I mean, a, the chiropractor example is very powerful, and I've got a client that has, you know, a similar kind of story um, in a different business, but it's a very personal story to him that mm -hmm. he tells, and that's his why. The um, idea of taking kind of the daily interactions with your daughter or with your family and turning that into something that then becomes a lesson for her um, audience is is something that I really do admire though because that's mm -hmm. taking kind of the everyday more mundane things. Some of those may not be world-shattering events or life-changing, but they're stories and they can be a metaphor for something in business and a lesson mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. And it, it it draws you in, and it gets you to um, listen to her, and it makes you feel connected with her because mm. it's sharing something that's somewhat personal. I mean, she's pretty good about sort of, you know, maintaining a line mm. um, so that there is some, you know, there is still some mystery there, right? She's not sharing everything, but I think she's opened herself up enough, and I think that's this whole... <laughs> <laughs> it just frustrates me sometimes. It, you know, every, we're supposed to be vulnerable now, right? We're supposed <laughs> to be really open. And sometimes I'm like, oh, stop with the madness. But, I, you know, I, I, I understand it because I, by the time I've actually decided I want to work with somebody, I already feel like I know them. Or, or, or if I do decide that I want to work with them, um, it, it's because I feel like I know them. And that means that they have done a spectacular job at their communication. Mm. Spectacular. Yeah. All right. Well, let me ask you, why do you do what you do? You know, I have a real passion for, for small businesses. Um, I, I, I really want to see them thrive, and I see so many of them struggling with this idea of the day kind of thing when it comes to marketing. Hmm. And when I know that if you just install this system, <laughs> if you just take a little bit of time to – um, determine who your ideal client is, determine why, you know, what, what makes you stand out, what, what is your unique value proposition, and find a way to communicate that and then install some of these tactics and, and manage them on a day-to-day -day basis, you will have great success. So, I, you know, my why in my business is very personal from a, I just, I wanted flexibility. I wanted to be, you know, have more time with my family. Hmm. Um, so that's why I start, you know, started my own business. But my why from a serving standpoint is I have a real passion for the, that's why I started Small Biz Power, that the, the small businesses who I consider are the engine of our economy, who are just making things happen for us these days. I want to help them. Hmm. That's a very strong why. I can understand that pretty well because it's sort of similar to my why. I guess my personal one is that I always got a huge buzz when somebody said you've made a difference to my business or you've made a difference to me personally. Oh, um, so Isn't that, that nice? It's yeah. so nice. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know surprisingly in the corporate world I did have that quite a few times and at a point where that all of a sudden stopped because I, you know, the environment had changed in the corporation that I was working for and the relationships at a corporate level with some of the customers had deteriorated to the point where I was just apologizing for the company. Uh, when I visited customers, I thought it's time to make a change because I wasn't having that need met. So that's, that's sort of the personal one, but 
definitely you know serving others and helping small business that I, I think is the engine of the economy and I think it's the way forward for the, the modern world the small you know there will be lots of big businesses around but and lots of behemoths but I think there's going to be a hell of a lot more small businesses that are going to be nimble and drive innovation and make huge changes to everyone's lives. Mm -hmm. I agree. Hmm. All right. Now, I'm fascinated how you put together your packages based on based on the duct tape marketing system and you've got, you talked about social media package that you started with and I know you've got a whole bunch of different packages that you offer on your website. How did you structure all that? So a lot of that is uh, based on the duct tape marketing framework. Um, with the social media packages, you know, when we first started the business, that was a constant iteration <laughs> mm. because social media is constantly changing. Same with digital marketing. Um, but with duct tape, you know, we, we, use a, um, we, we use a set of tools that has been found to be very effective um, for small business tools to, to um, tools like grade.us to gather reviews. Um, uh, tools like UpCity to, to manage SEO, uh, tools like Yext to um, handle citations and directories. So, uh, you know, a lot of that coupled together has been shown to be extremely effective to, you know, boost rankings for whatever keywords local businesses want to be found for. So most of the packages that are on my website are, are based on the duct tape marketing framework. And then, of course, you know, when it comes to podcasting services or the, or the different services, video services, you know, all of that is, is still a, a work in progress for sure. Um, and I, I'm really trying to come up with a video solution for small businesses, Jurgen, because I feel like... You know, we talked a little bit about this idea of, you know, getting small business owners in front of the camera. Um, you know, they're, they're uncomfortable with that. But what if we could do an interview format and then we, you know, we edited the video. And what if we could do that a couple times a month and, and use those to replace a blog post? So I'm, I'm working on some of that because I, you know, I have a great relationship with this, with a local studio here. And, um, and so I'm working to sort of, you know, I'm doing that for some clients, but I, I just I wanted to package it a little bit better. So constantly working working on like what you like to, to discuss as innovation. I'm, I'm trying to solve that problem because I don't think anyone has really solved it. And I don't think people are taking, you know, yes, video is more accessible, but I don't think people are picking up their iPhones and, and shooting it. They're, ju they're just not. Hmm. Um, some people are. I think maybe coaches are. But the small business owner, that's, that's not what they're doing. Um, so they, they need a strategy. They need a plan. They need so someone to shepherd them through this process. And I would like to be that person. Yeah, I think that's huge. That can be hugely valuable. I've started doing video testimonials for people and essentially doing the an interview, and then I just cut out the questions that I ask. So then it becomes a a person saying great things about the business and what they liked and what impact it's had on them. And yes, and it just is so much more valuable than something in writing with a little photograph. I also I bought a new toy recently, which is a little gimbal, handheld gimbal for the mobile phone, and I thought if I can just quickly do some videos, that's simple. So this is the other extreme or the other end, I guess, of your you know, needing to have the professional um, <laughs> thing, but it, I still want to have it professional, and that's why I got the gimbal, so it's not going to be a shaky video. Yeah. But it's got to be quick so that, you know, a small business can have that video done real quick, put up on their website or wherever it is for marketing purposes and, and then get the benefit from it. So I think is it a stabilizer? It's a stabilizer then. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. I've got to check it out. Sounds great. Mm. And one of the things I discovered on it, I didn't buy it for this and I didn't know it did this, but you can put it on a tripod and track a face. Oh. So I can put it in front of me to do a presentation and set it on tracking mode and then I can walk around the room, do the presentation and the thing just follows me around. That's brilliant. Which is quite amazing. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> so I'm, look, because I'm into photography in a big way and I've got um, more, you know, better for camera gear than, than just mobile phones. So I'm looking at these um, 
that type of thing for cameras, but then you're talking tens of thousands of dollars rather than, you know, five, six hundred. I think that's why I always end up in the studio. Hmm. Really. I mean, because I can go, there's so many options that I get, you know, I get like, uh, you know what, someone else just shoot it. <laughs> yeah. Someone else just shoot the video and just yeah. hand me the mic and, you know, and, and if we've got a teleprompter, awesome. Um, I can make it, I can get it done that much faster. But I think that's what happens to me is I get stuck in that, like, oh, uh, you know, too much technology. Technology is great, but it just affords us so many decisions and uh, I need, I need fewer decisions in my day. Yeah, that's right. And, one of the great things about having somebody else film it is that you can concentrate on the presentation so you don't mm-hmm. have to worry about the other stuff. So that, that's always, if I'm doing something myself, I find that really challenging because I've got to concentrate on the technology, concentrate on doing the video, and then at the same time I'm trying to present something. And I normally do presentations unscripted, so I'll rehearse it but then just present it naturally. Um, and that requires a fair bit of concentration. A lot of concentration. Mm. (laughs) That's amazing. All right. Well, this has been really fascinating, Nina. I think it's time we moved on to the buzz, which is our innovation round designed to help our audience who, you know, they like to be innovators and leaders in their field and give them some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions, and hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers that will inspire people to go and do something awesome. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so what's the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Shut off your brain and move. <laughs> Get out, take a walk, take a bike ride. Just shut off your brain, shut off the phone, and get moving. That's great advice, and, and I actually do quite a bit of that. I noticed recently because I'm, uh, I've am i been off the bike for six weeks so I'm unfit and not able to keep up with all my buddies so I tend to be riding alone a lot and that's where I get my best ideas. Me too. I, you're a road biker. I, I heard in one of your podcasts that you were you were talking about biking so you're a road biker? Uh, mainly road biking. I do um, mountain biking as well but mainly road. Nice. Mm. Okay. Love it. <laughs> all right what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Or new products? I think, what is the best thing I've done to develop new ideas? Again, hopped on the bike, gone for a walk, uh, recorded anything in my iPhone that I came up with while there and, and in the subsequent shower and, <laughs> and whiteboarded it all out, mapped it out so that I could get what was in my brain out on paper. Yeah. That's great. So you record, so, so if you get an idea on the bike, you record it on the iPhone? I try to, or I will pull over and uh, write down a note. I'll use the notes feature on the iPhone. Okay, yeah, because I probably need to do that some more. I was, <laughs> I was out recently, and I think I got to five ideas, and I, I kept thinking, okay, that's five, and so I could just kept reciting them one, one after the another while I was riding to make sure I... I remember um, remembered them, but then you know, <laughs> I got to five and I thought, oh, that reminds me, there's another one, and now I'm up to six. <laughs> it's hard to remember, and, and you know, they're fleeting, so, mm. so I, at least for me. I mean, sometimes they come to me. I, I also uh, problem solve when I'm walking, running, or riding, mm. um, so, so, you know, solutions to problems come to me as well, so I do, I have found myself pulling over a lot of times to either record something, my voice, or to write it down in the notes. Mm. Great advice. All right, what's your favorite tool or system for improving your own productivity and allowing you to be more innovative? I love teamwork. I'm a big fan of teamwork. It's a project management tool, but teamwork, if I put all the tasks in teamwork, I don't have to worry about the details. It reminds me of the details so that my brain can be free of the details so I can think more big picture. Mm. Yeah, great. So it's, it's always good to have something where you can put the information, get it out of your head and then have it easily accessible and also have it remind you to follow up when it's time to take action, right? Mm-hmm, for sure. All right, what's the best way to keep a client on track or a project on track? Good old-fashioned nagging. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I think, um, <laughs> I think the best way 
to keep a project or client on track is um, is through clear communication and giving them an understanding of of what's at stake if we don't stay on track um, because that puts skin in the game for them as well. Hmm. Yeah, communication is so important, isn't it? Huge. And clear communication. Now, having said that, I think having a clear system to follow, which you have, is really important. And the other part of your clear system is understanding who your ideal client is. So if you pick the right client to start with, you've probably done 90% of keeping the project and client on track already. <laughs> Yeah, and, and to the, the communication point, helping them understand what you're doing. Hmm. This, digital marketing is like Greek to most business owners. It really is. And so and 99% and of the, the companies out there don't take the time to explain what they are doing and why it matters to the client in layman's terms. And I call on the journalism background to do that a lot, Jurgen. I call on the take a complicated concept and boil it down into two sound bites so that you, the viewer at home, can understand it. I do the same thing with my clients. I help them understand what these digital marketing concepts are, why they matter for their business, and what we are doing on a regular basis. So transparency and communication are paramount, and it keeps the client engaged, and it keeps the project moving forward. Mm. That's great advice, and I like that you say, you know, you explain to them why, why, and, you know, why it's important to them. Mm-hmm. So, all right, so what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Just be authentic. I mean, don't, don't try to emulate others. I, I Don't be afraid to, to, to show who you really are. Um, you know, for, for, for me, that's that maybe that's allowing a little sarcasm or, you know, um, calling on my background as a journalist and a, and a storyteller in a digital age. I mean, just 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 trying to be who you are and embracing who you are and and being fully authentic about it is the best way I think you can differentiate yourself. That's great advice. And I, I think a lot of people that I interview say, you know, be yourself and be authentic. And I think it's probably the one thing that differentiates you because that's you. Mm-hmm. And Yeah. And also have the confidence to be yourself rather than, oh, I, I like person X as a model, so I think I'll try to be like them. Yes, learn from the model, but be yourself. Of, of course, and I think you know, for somebody like me, who if you think about it, I mean, you know, you've you've been in the marketing realm for for many many years, and and I'm I'm five years in to marketing, and so it is tempting sometimes to emulate somebody maybe who's who's farther along in their in their journey than I am, um, but the truth of the matter is, I am who I am, and that's when I really lean on the the background that I have and and how it translates. Um, but it's not always easy to be authentic when you, you feel like, oh, well, you know, sometimes you suffer from imposter syndrome or, or whatever it is, right, or, or, you, or you have a lack of confidence. But I think, I think really people connect when you are um, true to who you are and you're not afraid to be that way. Mm, great advice. All right, so what's the future for you then and for Radatich Marketing and Media? I think a lot of the things that we talked about, um, you know, really bringing um, bringing my background more into the business. Um, you know, I think when I started it, it was um, really focused on duct tape, and it, and it will continue to be focused on the duct tape marketing system, but with more of a um, a focus and a priority on video. Uh, audio, you know, really trying to push podcasting um, and the storytelling piece, really focusing on that uh, from a differentiation standpoint and for clients who are interested in that. I, I just, you know, I think in general with when it comes to digital marketing, everything is going the specialty route. Uh, I wanted to build a business that would be a one-stop shop for small businesses, but I'm watching more and more. I mean, there are agencies just focused on Facebook advertising. There are agencies focused just on PPC. So I think that's sort of where the industry is going, and to differentiate yourself, you really have to find 
a, a specialty, a niche to stand out, and, and I want to go down the video, audio, storytelling road a little bit more. Hmm. Okay, well, that's fascinating. I look forward to following that because I think, you know, given your background, video would seem to be a no-brainer to follow that up. And also, it's, I think it's something that is so powerful online these days. And mm-hmm. podcasting, podcasting's been around for quite a while, but it seems to having be having a rebirth at the moment, and, and it is very powerful as well huge resurgence in podcasting right now. I think, you know, I was listening to a podcast where they were talking about that and and one of the guests was saying it, it has everything to do with the fact that um, Apple's operating system now includes the podcast app as a default. Mm. And that's sort of what got everybody listening to podcasts or adopting a little bit more. Um, so yeah, there has been a real resurgence in it and I find it fascinating and really fun and, and I'm so appreciative that you're you're having me on yours. <laughs> yeah, I, f- I find it great fun. I mean, it's you get to talk to somebody for an hour and you learn all the lessons that they have to share. And the other thing I've found recently is I've been to some fairly high-powered presentations of people that have impressed me and I've gone up to them afterwards and I said, I've got this podcast that's got a big international audience. Can I have you on the podcast? And automatically that gives you credibility, you know, even though they don't know who you are. Um, they don't know anything about you, but you've got instant credibility and most people say, yes, we'd love to come on the podcast. It's a great door opener, isn't it? Mm, and I think yeah. that's that's really what we're focused on is is helping people understand the power of podcasting for relationship building. Yeah, great for content, um, you know, great for um, SEO, great for your website for sure, and great to build thought leadership, but also as a spectacular door opener and relationship builder for people, you know, on sales teams, uh, people who want to be leaders in their industry, coaches. I mean, there's there are a million applications for it but the relationship piece is is i think huge hmm. and and i've expanded my network right across the world and i'm mean, talking to people in las vegas just it's of, cool right 20, that we can do this yeah that's right 24 hours uh, travel time to get to see one another in person so you know in the old days that's what you needed to do and then you know you needed to have the introduction as well so it's um, it's fascinating All right, um, so what's the number one piece of advice you'd give to any business owner who wants to be a leader in innovation and in their field? Well, I think that you need to allow your leaders some time and space away to think and grow their creativity. We're so in an always-on atmosphere nowadays, and... I mean, I'm guilty of it. We're married to these smartphones, right? I mean, we never put the smartphone down. And, uh, you know, I, I was, I got to a point where I was so in front of a computer all the time that I would go out with my friends and I was like, do I even remember how to interact with people? Because, <laughs> and I, and I was, I was losing creativity. I was losing the ability to visualize. And I, you know, that, that was one of, in a very busy time. But it it made me realize that that's the number one thing that people need to do. They need to have time away, and it's harder and harder to come by nowadays, but it's what opens up um, the brain cells. It's what, you know, it it opens up those neurological pathways to get you thinking um, from a visualization standpoint, from a larger standpoint, from a big picture standpoint, to, to innovate, to transform, to do whatever you need to push your company forward. Hmm. Yeah, great advice. And I was speaking to a lady who will be a guest on our podcast probably later in in the year, but she's a neuroscientist and she was talking about how, you know, we actually have the capacity to rebuild brain cells. Um, whilst the brain's always shedding cells, it's also rebuilding. And, and one of the key things, so there's five things she talked about that are important to rebuilding brain cells, but one of the key things is interaction with other people, but mm. real in-person, face-to-face, eye contact type interaction. And she said one of the big issues these days is is these mobile devices that people are locked into. Hmm. 
their only their only social interaction then becomes social media or interacting <laughs> yeah, on that's Facebook, right. yeah. and it's just not it's it's so different. It's so different. So I I completely relate to that. And I, I like I said I did go through a time where I was like wow I um I have lost the I, I I have always been able to walk into a room and just start talking to people and not feel uncomfortable about it. I've never had an issue with that. And I I remember thinking I, I don't know what to say. I don't. <laughs> So I knew at that point, I was like, man, I got to see my friends more often. This is ridiculous. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm cooped up like a hermit too much. Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been really fantastic, Nina. Thank you for coming on the podcast and being so open and sharing with us. Where can people reach out to say thank you? Oh, they can reach me on my website at ninaradatich.com. Or um, I'm most active, I'd say, on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and the Facebook page is, uh, is facebook.com slash Nina Radatich. And the Twitter handle is at Nina R. Vegas. Thank you for having me, Jurgen. This has been great. All right. And we'll have um, links to all of those uh, sites in the show notes under the blog post. So finally, who would you like me to interview on a future Nova Buzz podcast and why? Oh, wow. I think it would be great if you interviewed um, my friend, Dr. Eileen Ruhoy. She is up in the Seattle area, and her business is the Center for Healing Neurology. And she is working heavily on um, – she's a neurologist – trained neurologist and she is just this based on our, our just our conversation I think she I think she would be fascinating um, to talk to but she is working on preventive um, treatments for for the brain essentially um, and her approach is is really really innovative it's it's from a sort of it's putting Eastern and Western medicine together in one practice and I think she would be fascinating to talk to Mm, sounds fascinating. All right. Well, hopefully you can give us an introduction. So, Eileen, if you're listening, look out for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Nina Radetich. Awesome. So, th- thanks again for sharing your time and your insights with us today, Nina. I've really enjoyed this immensely. I could go on for ages, but I need to respect your time. And I wish you all the best for the future for Radetich Marketing and Media, and let's keep in touch. Thank you so much, Jürgen. It's been my pleasure. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Nina as much as I did. She's a very engaging personality with an interesting background and her journey to a marketing business is fascinating. This interview is filled with a lot of valuable advice. All the great ideas and tips that Nina shared with us can be found at innovabiz.com.au forward slash Radetich Marketing. That is R-A-D-E-T-I-C-H-M-A-R-K-E-T-I-N-G. All lowercase or one word, innovabiz.com.au forward slash Radetich Marketing. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Nina there and connecting with her. We'd love to hear about your experience using storytelling and video to engage with your audience and what you'll do as a result of Nina's suggestions in the comments below the blog post. Nina suggested I interview Dr. Eileen Ruhoy from the Center for Healing Neurology on a future Innova Buzz podcast. So Eileen, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast courtesy of Nina Radetich of Radetich Marketing and Media. If you haven't already done so, head on over to iTunes or Stitcher or Pocket Casts and subscribe to the Innova Buzz podcast so you'll never miss a future episode. Of course, we always welcome feedback and reviews, so let us know how we're doing. If there's anything you'd like us to cover or questions you want answered on a future Innova Buzz podcast, or if you have guests you'd like us to interview, please send those ideas to us. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from Innova Biz. Be awesome and keep innovating.